There's a lot of content on longevity, but it tends to be hypothetical. So stay tuned to find out how I reverse my biological age. Hi guys, in this week's episode, we're gonna be looking at my pace of aging, as well as the length of my telomeres, you know, the caps on the end of your chromosomes. We're also gonna talk about two of the most popular anti-aging drugs, which are rapamycin and metformin, just seeing how they relate to my biological clock. As I'll be doing a repeat test in the next few weeks, as this test was actually done on the 21st of June, so lots of changes have already taken place. On top of this, we're gonna be talking about some popular senolytics like fisetin. The previous episodes talked about true diagnostics, omic age clock, and how that relates to different systems of aging. The same with the Dunedin as well. Yeah, the Dunedin, exactly. And, and, and then there you're actually performing really well. So if we go to that summary report, again, we can go through these, but you're, again, your Dunedin pace is, is not bad at all. You know, you're below one. We would obviously want this to be a little bit lower, but you're, you know, sort of right around that trend line. Well, well, and that, again, that- I'm trying to remember that, what you are, because I saw a video, a podcast you did, uh, was it 0.85? Something like that. I uh, to be honest, with you, yeah, it's around the point eight. Um, yeah, so it's uh, my, but to be honest with you, mine's not even that great. Um, uh, compared to where I want I would be, but uh, but yeah, so I think that you know you do, you you look pretty good. Um, uh, you know, even going to the immune system, we can see your CD four to CD eight T cell ratio looks excellent. You're right around one point four six. Um, you know, which is is pretty good. Um, you know, we can look at your immune cell uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which is sometimes a marker of physiologic stress. And you, you're a little bit elevated there, but not out, terribly outside of normal. Um, so I think that that's good as well. Um, and so your telomere length is, you know, again, not bad. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, no diabetes, increased markers. Your inflammation, again, here reads a little bit high. So this is another one of the new reports that we do. Oh, we yeah, actually saw this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Protein. yeah, and, and, and so IL you're a little bit really higher. High, yeah. Yeah, your IL-6 is, is, is definitely high, um, but your C-reactive protein is a little bit high too. Um, and so we, we generally, I would say, care about the C CRP more than the IL-6, um, but we're just seeing, again, inflammation across the board. So something is probably really giving you some inflammatory issues. Um, and... Uh, and trying to maybe find that is easier said than done, but um, mm. but probably, you know, trying to get that inflammation down um, will be helpful. Since doing that test, I have I was doing like metformin, like one one tablet a week. And now I've gone up to, I went I went up to even eight, 850 milligrams a week. Yeah. And then I think I was noticing a bit like, um, like DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness for people watching. So mm. like a, I think because yeah. maybe that combined with rapamycin at six milligrams and then trying to cut down on my meat consumption things that all combined at the same time I was actually noticing yeah. like it was more likely I was actually getting like a, you know, a muscle soreness so it's trying to mm -hmm. like get that delicate balance and now I've gone down to like four metformins a week like so it's two days a week on my on my off training days and then I might do one day on berberine where I'm exercising yeah. maybe not as much I might not be doing any cardio so it's a kind of in between and yeah just trying try and error really to yeah no I think that's good I think that you know if you've done metformin especially even gone up on dose we'll probably certainly see it on your HbA1c and in fasting glucose on any next test um and so um so yeah I think that that uh that should be good, but I'll, I'll send you a couple of different resources as well with whenever I send this to you, um, including our omic age sort of uh, presentation that we did on last Thursday, but also all of these different assets, um, including one that goes through each of those markers specifically to just tell you uh, a little bit more about it. So you can sort of see all these in individual markers and and what's important. So I know you said you your when you first tested um, your overall biological age, you've you've made some improvements. I mean, were you actually? Have, yeah. Uh, what was your pace of age? Was that higher as well then? Yeah, so absolutely. It was moving in congruency. Um, so I've gotten both down. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think for, for they generally will move uh, in a much more consistent fashion now as well with Omega Gage. And so, yeah, because you incorporate rapamycin into your protocol, yeah? Yeah, I do. Um, and occasionally a lot of other things, but rapamycin is definitely a staple. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, with similar kind of dose, what, five, six milligrams, something like that? um yeah so i usually will do six milligrams once weekly okay yeah cool and then what metformin have you have you tried that one uh i have uh off and on but uh you got it right here actually but uh <laughs> you know uh so i'm not doing metformin at the moment because i'm doing instead um an sgl2 inhibitor um i i don't know if you're familiar with those but um they basically just make your kidneys permeable to glucose so you sort of 
pee out your glucose. Um, right. And so I'm, I'm trying that one now because it has some good longevity data, particularly in, in mice. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I've heard Jay Campbell talking about that, actually. Yeah, I think he... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, so yeah, so I'm doing that instead of the metformin, just mainly, to be honest with you, because of those performance related effects you were describing with mm -hmm. the delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, for me, as someone who's probably, you know, not close to diabetic sub, you know, uh, phenotype, uh, I probably want to focus more on the fitness and insulin sensitivity with the muscles, but also then just reducing that glucose in the urine, I think is a, a good mechanism. Yeah, and I think that's maybe that's the problem with metformin is a kind of like double-edged sword, isn't it? So it's trying to find that yeah. sweet spot where you're getting some benefit from it. So I found like I may be going up and I say if there's a particularly busy week where I'm moving less and then exactly. you're thinking, and then I, there's no way I can't eat less food, even though I'm moving less. I'm just like, you know, I've got an appetite and, uh, which actually it gets yeah. me on to, um, cause you, know, you got your obesity report. So my telomeres being, what were they again? In the 38th, percentile so yeah. there's maybe yeah i'll pull them up right now yeah so we can have it on screen maybe while we while we discuss um because then because maybe yeah. if i um because i could relate to maybe i've got a high amount of senescent cells in relation to that yeah so, um... well yeah certainly yeah, so I'm happy to maybe just give you a brief primer on this. You know, generally, um, one of the things we, we talk about with telomere length is it's, it's generally not that predictive of outcomes. Um, so it, it's certainly a hallmark of aging. But um, in, a, in a study, the Generation Scotland study, they looked at how much of your phenotypes or aging outcomes are due to um, telomere length. And they found it was right two, around 2%. Two, two, two yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2.8, right? 2 .8, Versus okay. the epigenetic clocks, which are now, you know, above 50. Um, and so the epigenetic clocks are what we're going to maybe pay attention to. But I think, as you mentioned astutely, telomere length is still indicative of a, a process in aging, which is also highly related to senescent cells. Because as our telomere lengths get really short, then they, they undergo senescence as a way to protect against proliferating DNA damage loss. Yeah. Um, and so, so sometimes people do make the assumption that lower telomere lengths are generally correlated with higher amounts of senescence. Um, and then you might therefore recommend a senolytic treatment or protocol um, for this. Um, and again, the most common supplement uh, for, for senescence is generally fisetin. Um, uh, uh, and, and so for you, you're not, your telomere length isn't too bad. Again, you can look, you're almost, you know, touching that average trend line. Right. Um, the other thing I should say about this, though, is that um, we don't have a lot of necessarily recommended things to improve your telomeres um, yet. Um, you know, some people might recommend things like hyperbaric. Um, other people might recommend, uh, you know, senolytics as a way to raise the average to just get rid of the lowest telomere cells. Uh, but the other thing that's been studied here is omega-3 fatty acids, which tend to show uh, a correlation, not immediately in a treatment, but in a cross-sectional analysis over time, right. people who have better telomere, uh, uh, omega-3 uh, profiles or supplement tend to have better telomere lengths. So we certainly would recommend that. For you, I wouldn't necessarily recommend a synolytic. Um, and the reason being for that is that you're you're not too low just yet. And also you're pretty young, meaning you're going to have much lower burden of senescence than other individuals anyway. Um, and I do want to just also mention that we did just publish a trial on senescence and senolytics um, uh, comparing to satin and quercetin and biocetin. And we found that none of them necessarily had a significant positive effect on the biological aging process. I really um, okay. Yeah. And in fact, those first generation clocks that we don't like, the ones trained to predict chronological age, they actually go up with synolytics. Um, so so we, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for you. Again, there were limitations with this study. Um, you know, we only had around, uh, you know, 19 patients. So it's still really small. But I, I think that we we don't really have a good connection between senescence and other biomarkers yet um, uh, in DNA methylation. So I, I don't know, other than omega-3s, that might be the only thing I'd recommend here. But I wanted to bring up one other thing, which relates back to the conversation we had previously um, about maybe some of the other markers on your omic age report. And one of the big markers that we always see um, on the omic age report is the IGF-1 binding protein 2. Um, and so I want to just uh, briefly share this with you as well, which is that, um, uh, or I should say, not IGF-1 binding protein 2, but red cell distribution width. So we knew that this was, was a little bit higher uh, on your report, which again is looking at um, how common that red cell size is. Um, and generally we want it to be really common. But in this particular study, they found that um, 
that they were trying to ask the question, why is red cell distribution with so highly linked to mortality? Um, and they found a couple different proteins which were differentially regulated here. Um, but um, some of them um, go to EGFR, which is kidney filtration rates, um, IGF-1 binding protein 2, which is inflammatory mediators. Um, and so their interpretation of this data was that cellular senescence may contribute to higher red cell distribution with oh, and the link okay. of that to mortality. So we did see on your, your report that your red cell distribution width was a little high, as well as some of the inflammatory markers and some of the kidney markers like your EGFR. So this might suggest that you might be particularly at a higher risk of senescence than other individuals um, because of all of those different factors, not just telomere length. Um, so, uh, so going back to the, you know, going back to your telomere length, um, I wouldn't worry about it just yet, but I would probably say getting your inflammation under control might also lead to better telomere lengths over time. Okay. So that might be since that test, I was only doing really low amounts of um, TMG, trimethylglycine, mm -hmm. and then I was having quite. I have a lot, a lot of um, bovine collagen peptides, like I'm now like fifteen grams a day, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So like, uh, but yeah, just I have NAC to get inflammation down. Um, yeah, all these various things, but yeah, and now, yeah, now I do. Uh, I was only doing marginal tiny bits of uh, TMG, but now I've gone up to like two and a half grams of it. So hopefully that, mm -hmm. um, hopefully that kind of reflects in my score moving, moving forward. But yeah, you were saying about um, analytics and I was talking to John Sfoir Tremblay about FOXO4 mm -hmm. uh, DL, DL. Yeah, DRI. Yeah. And yeah. Then he was saying like young, like he's seen reports like young people in their thirties doing it. And then they don't generally feel that good because you know, for every 10 senescent cells it nukes, it takes like a good, a healthy cell. And so like, so you get some younger men doing it and then they don't feel, don't feel that good while they're on it, basically. Yeah, certainly. And, and, you know, they're, yeah, that, that, that is a very potent synolytic. Um, uh, you know, I think that there are, or maybe some other options that, that uh, are a little bit lighter than that. Um, so mm -hmm. like the Fizetin, for instance, as a new dietary nutrition supplement, usually you're not causing massive, you know, lysis of senescent cells and having to clean up any of that or having any of those other, you know, other factors associated with it. But then do you think, yeah, but not doing it for too long, like something like Fizetin, yeah, it's always maybe? Yeah, so that's another good question. One that again, I don't know that we know the answer to. Mm -hmm. um, in our in our study that we did, we did pulse it. So we we were doing synolytics uh, on days one, two, and three of each month, and then then basically taking the rest of the month off. Um, I, I do think that that tends to be the biggest uh, medical strategy at the moment, but there's not a lot of data to say if that's a good or bad idea. Um, so, uh, but I but I, I would certainly say it's uh, uh, probably what most people are doing. Yeah, because you think in like nature terms, you know, I think like a common like uh, fisetin supplement, I think they're saying each tablet has about 200 worth, 200 strawberries worth of fisetin in. So, mm -hmm. you know, in in like ancestral times, no one would ever eat 200 strawberries or at least. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then that's one thing, your body overloading with it, you know, for a short period of time, it's not really not going to you know do much damage but you think if you're doing that for like six months on end you know it could be mm -hmm. downstream effects that you're not you can't really predict you know exactly exactly um yeah so so uh again i think but but, but you know generally with senescence i think that we're we're maybe seeing some markers related but we don't have a really good blood base marker so it's hard to speculate whether or not you should or should not be but i think that with some of the inflammatory markers we're seeing that might be the bigger focus mm -hmm. Next week's episode, I'm going to be looking at my fitness report, which includes things like VO2 max, grip strength, gait speed. We're also going to be looking at my obesity report on top of that too. Thanks for watching. See you next week.